Welcome to Behind the Zines, the football magazine podcast where we talk to some of the people behind your favourite football mags. Created by Joseph Fordham, No Place Like Home is a quarterly magazine dedicated to the written and visual storytelling of the beautiful game. It features a collective of writers, photographers, creatives, but above all, fans. With alternative perspectives on the game, it showcases the unusual, untold corners of the sport, but also has unique takes on the familiar stories that we all know and love. Born out of an Instagram interaction between Joe and Neil Jameson, or as he's more commonly known, the sport and press, No Place Like Home has become a must-have in every football fan's collection if you're quick enough to get your hands on it. We're incredibly lucky to chat to Joe today to talk about the unusual start of the mag, the global collaborations that go into making it, and the most recent release. Enjoy the podcast. I don't know where you're going with this, but go on. Before we delve into the content of the magazine, and there's kind of a lot to delve into, can we just talk about how you and the creative director, Neil Jameson, met and, and created this mag yeah <clears throat> excuse me so um it was back in 2017 and at the time nplh was a fanzine i don't know if you can see that but this was a this was a west ham fanzine so it had its own instagram account and somehow came across sporting press on it uh he followed back it might have gone the other way around i don't know um but yeah he was a massive fan of the work he was putting out and we began to just interact a little bit um i wanted mplh to become something else something a bit more substantial so i just uh i basically just felt him out really and just said are you are you interested in in doing this this is what i want to do are you are you keen i, I put three three choices on the email um like different tiers of of yes, basically. I feel like you've um, slid my note in class of yes, yeah, no, maybe. Exactly. So I, I engineered it in such a way that whichever whichever option he chose, he was involved in some way. So I was quite clever there. But he was all in from the start, which is great. Um, and we actually, it turns out he's from Preston in the north, but based in the US. Massive Preston North, East, uh, Preston north End fan. Um and yeah, we actually made four issues before we even met in person. Uh, luckily, we got on when we did meet, and so we yeah we managed to make a few more since. But yeah, odd really, just the fact that it was some um, speculative DMs that have that have led to something that's quite beautiful, really. Yeah, and the, and the most recent issue you, you kind of touch in the in the notes at the start that you know it's a two year birthday and and things like that. How how do you think the the magazine's grown since since that kind of meeting and since those those early days? Yeah, um, I get incredibly nostalgic around birthdays and anniversaries, so you probably picked up uh, on the tone in the editor's letter there. Um, from, well, if you compare the the first issue to this one, which I don't think a lot of people can, is there's a they're out there somewhere the first issue, but yeah, you wouldn't recognise the first one. Uh, a few of the names are consistent throughout every issue but in terms of the quality that we're putting out it's um it's a different completely different animal the format is very much the same but yeah in terms of the quality we've progressed massively in two years i think um slowly in terms of uh, awareness but in terms of quality it's a massive rapid change definitely yeah and um, visually that's all down to Neil of course uh, but we've also uh, improved editorially I think throughout yeah and you, you said there like with, with Neil and things like that and it's impossible to kind of talk about the magazine without talking about him and kind of how good the magazine looks and it, it's not just you know your front cover I think uh, kind of in football magazines now front covers are kind of everything and and it's really improving but throughout the mag there's kind of a consistency but a difference as well and how important is it for you that kind of for both of you how important is neil for one and how important is it to make them aesthetics and and it to look good yeah um yeah neil is very much responsible for the what MPLH has become aesthetically, without a doubt. Uh, it's a million miles away from what I had in mind 
when we first started and I didn't know what to expect when we um <laughs> when we got the first set of layouts back but he, I mean he goes in he really goes in on these layouts and they are incredible and the best thing about it is he's he's so modest and he's he's such a nice guy that he he would probably squirm if he could hear me describing him as arguably one of the best if not the best around I think he is anyway so we're incredibly lucky I feel incredibly lucky to work with him um and so in yeah in that respect Neil is vital to what MPLH is but equally uh, so are the the other illustrators that we have on board and the photographers that we use because without them then uh you know Neil has has got very little to work with in terms of creating a magazine and and like it, you've touched on there of and it's kind of a, a similar and familiar theme throughout i think it's what's kind of beautiful about football magazines is it's this collaborative effort and it's lots of different writers and it's lots of different artists and it's the parents that kind of make sense and would you say that it's right to say that mplh is a collaborative effort absolutely yeah um <clears throat> excuse me i i think uh, yeah as i touched on we've got some incredible artists and writers uh, uh, different styles of writers as well and i think it's important to mention those because it does get a lot of praise for its looks but it's it's by no means all style no substance it's uh it's good quality writing and hopefully it will start to get some recognition in that respect as well but it does look very pretty, so we we shouldn't gloss over that. But yeah, very much a, a collaborative effort. I mean, these these creatives they they spend time working on on these pieces, either writing or, or creating beautiful pieces of art for MPLH around work life, family life, and and without them, like I say, we just wouldn't have anywhere near the the quality that we've got. We're very very lucky, and I I think maybe maybe uh a big part of it is they they know they can trust us with their work if that makes sense so neil you know even the ph photographers will hand over images knowing that they're they're in safe their, their images are in safe hands you know and the artists the same again they can't wait to see what neil does with the piece they submit and it's all new to him uh i gather the content and basically just put the the folder on his lap and he's not seen anything and uh, at all throughout and you know he'll open up a a piece of art from uh slip the the french artist who the peter crouch uh robot in issue seven and he'll just run with it you know and, and that's the beauty of it he'll just and every artist is so different that the fact that neil can you know, keep his head on a swivel for each feature and come up with a spread that is just as eye-catching as the last. Yeah, testament to his ability, but also great to see those two those two styles clashing. You know, the nil and and the uh, individual artist. Yeah, and I think like touching on kind of the recent issue, which we'll go into later, is there's a piece in it, and it, it kind of I think sums up the magazine. Is it, it's kind of like a, a beautiful mismatch of kind of football culture and tone of you've got this amazingly funny written piece about Peter Crouch and the robot and you're reading it still thinking is this piece all about Peter Crouch and the robot and it is and it's yeah. brilliant but then you've got this wonderful piece about like the late Barcelona manager Tito Villanova and it's just how do you go about selecting and organising this kind of content when they're so different but at the same time they're, they're so alike in the way that they're written and, and the tone yeah you've touched on two of the two very different writers there but both incredibly incredibly talented uh so the peter crouch article just to go back to that for a second so jason jones is uh an absolute maverick and god knows where his mind's at but he will He'll come with, come in with an idea. So uh, the the theme goes out to a pool of writers, and the pitches come in. And Jason will always come back with something that makes you think, "What? What are you, 
What do you mean? Because it's not just oh, I want to write about Peter Crouch's robot robot dance. He's it's and for example, the issue we've got coming up, um, he he pitched it with uh, the an opening paragraph from Macbeth, <laughs> and you think no, that, I don't know where you're going with this, but go on. Um, even uh, issue four, going back to issue four, he wrote a piece on Freddie Adu. And the, the first two or three paragraphs are about Macaulay Culkin playing a, a gig in Nottingham. And you, you, how are you going to tie this in? But he does. He's, he's incredibly talented. Um, and I think it's important with writers like that that have got so much personality to just let them get on with it. And, and the reader will benefit from that, you know. Um, so on the flip side of that, Will is, um, I mean, I've said it before, he kind of writes with a paintbrush. He's got this lovely turns of phrase. Um, yeah, incredible writer. And I guess, yeah, to answer your question, I've gone off on a bit of a tangent there. Uh, we try and get the, the best balance possible. We, we don't want 11 features that tug on the heartstrings, um, but we want 11 features that are kind of going to keep people on their toes from one to the next. So like you say, yeah, Tito Villanova, incredibly heartfelt piece. Um, but then Peter Crouch will just make people feel good about themselves for five minutes while they're reading it. Maybe a few good memories of some tournaments from back in the day, some headaches that followed. Yeah, so we just try and keep it fresh. Um, and yeah, just let people, like I say, write in the style that they're good at. We don't want to put any any chains on anyone because that's not what we, no one gets the, the benefit of that then, you know? Yeah, and I think as well, like, the magazine itself, like you said, it's come from such a place to, to where it is now and pretty much every issue is just keeps kinda of getting better and better. where where's your inspiration like for the the style, the kind of the voice that you want it to have? What what other magazines do you look to? What other kind of pieces of media and content do, do you draw inspiration from? That's a good one. Uh, yeah, I think it's for me it's important that every issue uh, covers as many aspects of the game as possible so not just the elite end but you you want to read some well I want to read something about um, a guy that's um, co- you know they, we've got the Royal Engineers women's coach and it's something it's, you're giving someone a platform that may never get one to talk about his experiences in the game or we've got the uh, the Q&A section where you, uh, you find out more about someone's grassroots initiatives and it's just warming to hear that kind of thing. It's great. It's all well and good, you know, reading about Ronaldo's wonderful season. We could read about that forever. I could anyway. But at the same time, I also want to know what, how people are using the game to kind of better themselves and others, basically. Yeah, so it's important that the magazine always carries a balance. Me. Before we jump into the most recent issue of No Place Like Home with Joe, a quick word about our sponsors today, Stanchion. This show is sponsored by Stanchion, the sports bookseller selling the finest independently minded magazines, fanzines and books that the world has to offer, with many of the titles featured in this series available to purchase. There's free shipping in the UK for all orders over £50 and free international shipping for all orders of £100. We're offering listeners to the podcast an exclusive 10% discount on everything in store. All you need to do is visit stanchionbooks.com and enter the discount code behind the zines at checkout. Offer ends 31st December 2020. Back to the podcast. Let's dig into the most recent release, which is issue seven, Fleeting Moments, Lasting Impressions. And each issue has a theme, with the upcoming one being fraternity. Um, so how do you go about deciding themes and, and what what was the, the kind of the reason for this issue's theme? I'm probably going to shatter some illusions now. Uh, there's There's no real process behind... A theme. Uh, so, uh, issue seven, there was a, a fashion book in the office that I worked at, and it was a beautiful coffee table book. I was just flicking through it, and uh, that phrase popped out on a pull quote. And I thought, oh, that's quite cool. I just made a note of it, and before you know it, you think, okay, this could really work. Send a send a message to Will on uh, Will Sharp, you know, the, the Tito Villanova writer, and I've had an idea, 
what do you think of this? Just bounce it around a little bit. Um, has to be on Twitter because he doesn't have WhatsApp for some reason. I don't know why. And uh, I've kind of grown. I, I, I can't use texts anymore. It's a, we, we only communicate via Twitter DM. It's a very strange relationship. Anyway, so we like, okay, yeah, this could work. We start to kind of spitball on some of the ideas that could come up. And once we've got a few, we think, okay, yeah, that could work. And then you know that the, you can trust the writers to have a, have a bit of fun with it. Uh, but then you go back to um, what was it, issue six, breaking the cycle, and that that came up on the train home after a few of us had gone down to Margate to watch an FA Cup game, and we'd had a few beers and we were just chatting and had to start work on the issue sooner rather than later. And yeah, I think it was Danny Lewis, uh, one of the writers, yeah, wrote the Berry piece in this issue and. That was actually his idea, yeah. Um, so there's no real, <laughs> there's no real kind of uh, set way of doing it. Sometimes something will just pop into me, and I'll read something, a poem, for example. Um, that's how issue four's "Death of the Dream" came about. Um, we've got a couple of issues lined up that will throw up some interesting pieces. But yeah, I'm afraid it's as technical as that. It could be from anywhere. As a train ride home from an FA Cup away. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, um, shattered some illusions there, I'm sure. There's probably a bunch of editors from other mags thinking we're putting too much effort in if this guy's just pulling, <laughs> he's just pulling words out of hats. <laughs> like, how? what is a rough kind of timeline for, for the mags from kind of that, from the idea of themes bouncing about once you've got that theme in mind? What what's your kind of rough deadline for for writers and and people to collaborate on? Okay, yeah. So usually, once the the theme's in, it depends on when that idea comes in in the life cycle of another issue. So right now we've got issue eight that is with Neil, and issue nine is already the theme's done, and we've got the pitches in, and it's just a case of finalising those i'm not looking beyond that now but that takes us up to that will come out in january i guess end of january something like that so we're quite far ahead um i'll probably so yeah to answer your question i'll probably start looking at issue 10 around um like september october figure out a theme and then we like to give the writers like six to eight weeks to turn a piece around and once they're in but once the pictures are in, we speak to the artists as well and similar sort of turnaround. But they, they usually come in a little bit later because um, I don't think they mind me saying this, but artists don't have any regard for deadlines. Uh, <laughs> Neil's probably, Neil will laugh when he hears that. But um, that is in, I say that in with love, honestly. Uh, so, yeah, it's, I'd say anywhere from once that's in and then there's the editing process and then it goes to Neil that can take quite a bit of time because obviously he has to fit that in around the sporting press and home life so yeah you're looking at around like it could take four four months to, to turn an issue around which is about right because it comes out three to four months but if we're working on one earlier then yeah we can cut that out a little bit but yeah three to four months but it, so, like in the most recent one, you kind of kicked the piece off with an interview you did with Kyle Martino, who's ex US international, and he's sharing a story about grassroots soccer in America and his kind of in- initiatives, as much as it pains us to say soccer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, how did that kind of story come about, and, and what was it like kind of sitting down and, and interviewing? Uh, I, so, I just. Uh... This might shatter some illusions again as well, but I just asked him, and he he said yeah. And it, so I came across those initiatives via uh, a guy called Sebastian, who uh, works at Players Tribune. Play, yeah, works for Players Tribune. He's behind the long form interviews that you may or may not have seen. And he he just alerted me to what Kyle was doing, and it was really interesting. And it seemed very NPLH that kind of thing, the sort of thing that we want to learn about and share and so yeah I just sent him a message on Instagram and you kind of think oh maybe that will come back maybe it won't but um, I figure if I don't hear anything I'll just ask again and 
kind of that yeah that's a habit of mine um but he got back to me and said yeah he'd love to do it and we spoke on a google hangout which seems like an age ago now that was probably the end of february something like that um and uh he's a really good guy i was actually quite nervous i had a bit of a man crush straight away so all of my uh, kind of yeah cool persona that i was just thought you know just chat with kai what we find um it just dripped away uh, and i was just a, like a teenager meeting a, a pop star or something it, but yeah full of energy really lovely guy and it was he was so candid it was really refreshing to hear him speak about the um like the u.s soccer federation the way he did and opened up on uh, he was very honest about his shortcomings with the um his run for the presidency it went really well got so much didn't need to go back for a second hit we, we had an embarrassment of riches in terms of content uh, and then it comes to transcribing it and um halfway through a break maybe a few days because uh you know it's quite a long time speak to someone for an hour with me transcribing that's about four hours worth of work so um <laughs> Anyway, I thought I'd lost the file. I went back to, so I just, I just recorded it on my phone. I you know, just uh, schoolboy. I was like, I've deleted it. I was like, oh my God, panicked. I think I maybe felt a little bit sick as well. I was like, I've got to speak to him again and get him to, uh, <laughs> to do that again. It was some of the best stuff as well. And I was like, what am I going to say? I look like an idiot. This looks so amateur. Which we are, we are amateur, but you don't want to look amateur. Um, so I messaged him anyway and said, "Look, this is embarrassing, but I've lost the file. Um, I don't know how I did it. I think I updated the software or something like that on my phone, and it wiped it. And um, I sent, I think, three messages without reply. And I was like, uh, it's gone. We're going to have to just make something out of what we've got." Or just drop it. Um, but then I realised I'd emailed it to someone, and so the file was sitting in my sent items, and it was just this amazing kind of moment where I was like, okay, good, we've got it back. It's back in, we're back in play. I'll just message Carl again and tell him it's fine. And uh, it turns out he hadn't seen any of the other messages, and he just replied once I said oh, I've found it. It's okay. It was I'd, I'd shared it with someone. Retrieved. And he just replied saying, glad that got sorted out. <laughs> so, God, yeah, it felt like a bit of a tool, but I was glad it got sorted out as well. He's a nice guy, actually. He's, he's lovely. And he, he's, uh, he's been very complimentary about the piece since. But, uh, yeah, I, I must have looked stupid. So now everything's backed up and backed up and backed up again going forward. So, like, another great interview that's in it is the feature piece called uh, Life Through a Lens by Alexis James, and it interviews three football photographers. And I think as a fan, it was just great to kind of hear about football photographers because it's something we, we take for granted completely as, you know, games done, pictures are on social media, pictures are on newspapers or whatever. So... Did you want to kind of create a, a magazine that allows those sorts of stories, like you said, that you don't really hear about, that you don't even think about? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, we do. Um, and to be honest, <clears throat> excuse me, I wasn't looking for that kind of article in particular for that issue. But Alexis is always full of really interesting ideas. So it was no surprise when he came in with that one. And it was a really different way of approaching a main feature for us in the form of a, a, a second Q&A in many ways. But yeah, it, it kind of opened, it pulled the curtain back on on something that definitely interests me on a personal level. Uh, I spent a few years as a freelance photographer, not to the standard, anywhere near the standard of these guys, but um, it's always interesting to hear how, how these people work and in high pressure conditions, you know, they've got seconds to get a shot the shot and um yeah so we were lucky that alexis managed to get three very good um well experienced and 
yeah, pretty high high profile photographers on board for it. And uh, and yeah, they were very very generous with their time and their images, as you saw. The Paul Pogba shot, I'm sure, will become an iconic image in time. And Alexander over in the in Australia, uh, he's got a wonderful style, and he's you know a, a massive back catalogue with Melbourne. Um, yeah, we were really and Robbie as well. Robbie looks more like uh, he looks like somebody should be photographing Kings of Leon, but uh, but yeah, it, it turns out he's a football photographer and a, and a, yeah, a very good one as well. But yeah, so like with kind of photography again, like you've just kind of touched on, and and it was something that you, you've done in the past and things. And when you kind of look at the magazine, although there's artwork that's kind of dotted throughout it, the photography in it's amazing, and the front cover itself is something that that's kind of it, it takes you aback. And did you kind of excuse the pun, but did you want it to kind of be such a focal point of of these these great images? Um, that was quite organic. Uh, so in our, our first issue, we ran uh, a West Ham photo story. And uh, yeah, so it was a, a, a story focused on female West Ham fans produced by uh, yeah Georgina Hunt. Um, fantastic set of images. And Neil uh, realised that we could really make something of, of that section you know really kind of make that a massive part of of the magazine's identity and that you know that's that's what he does you know he sees he's a creative director he's his pedigree is second to none so um so yeah we kind of just ran with that and from then we it was just well for me it then became a lot of fun scouring the internet for photographers um, that maybe you hadn't seen too much from. So yeah, issue two, we we ran this great set of Arsenal images that uh, that Ben Unwin had, had photographed during Wenger's early years, all on a 35 mil camera. Uh, some massive gang, you know, Cardiff, New Camp, all that kind of thing. Really evocative images, and from then on, it just became almost almost easy really to to find those kind of images because you just kind of I, I can spend a lot I could spend all day on the internet really looking at photographs and um one, but once we had that set and we could show what Neil did with those images it became quite easy to sell that position in the magazine to a photographer so like we love your work we'd love to share it with our readers here's what we'll do with it would you like to be a part of it and we've been very fortunate that yeah we've had some great photographers that have just jumped on board and made the, each issue what it is you know um no yeah no exceptions at all and they've all been quite different um yeah from one issue to the next so what you see here in issue seven with uh, fabio suarez will you know differs greatly to what you would have seen in issue five, which was a predominantly black and white set, but uh, taken at Port Vale matches in the early nineties, from a, from a guy that's now the photography lecturer at Bournemouth University, and those images hadn't been seen for twenty odd years. But then, yeah, fast forward to issue seven, and we've got this guy from Brazil who's producing this amazing content weekly, going to those games, and it's a, a different feel again. And it sets the tone, you know, like you say, that cover screams out. And we could have run five different covers with that magazine and each one would have been equally as, as gripping. We, we, I mean, we chose that one because it's so different, the, the blindfolded eyes. But seriously, it's a shame we had to only, we can only pick one. It really is. But yeah, it's a massive part of the magazine. And again, the credit goes to Neil there. Um, I admittedly, I didn't see the possibilities of that in the early days I just it would just seem like a good idea to run a, a portfolio at the back or a photo story sorry photo story but then uh yeah that's where Neil's expertise comes in and yeah that's what you see today now sort of 12 14 pages of stunning photography from artists around the world 
So issue seven, like all the others that have kind of gone before it on the site, is now sold out. It's quite a track record to kind of keep producing something that evidently people are enjoying and people are buying. Do you feel the pressure to try and do better than the last issue? Um, not in terms of selling out, no. Um, but in terms of making each issue better than the last, definitely. Yeah, uh, I feel like we've made a rod for our own back now and the readers will expect a, a high standard and rightly so every issue in terms of selling out i mean they're all gone now but issue four hung around for the best part of a year um we hadn't seen anything like the way issue seven flew out since the third issue which was uh like january 2019 but that was mainly down to Hibs fans. Uh, most of those copies have found their way to Edinburgh now. Uh, yeah, I think they're probably just trying to remember what happened in that 2016 finals. They were probably too drunk to wit to uh, to experience it in the flesh. But yeah, n- no pressure to sell out. Um, just the pressure to deliver um, the quality that we've become associated with, I guess. Yeah, and I think... Issue eight coming, the, the next one coming for me is the closest we've been to a perfect game so far. No pressure now. I've said that I'll probably get like a six out of ten for it or something like that. But but yeah, definitely uh, it's it's got the the um, the kind of balance that it's basically the closest issue to what I had in mind when MPLH started. And that's not to discredit the ones that have come before it. Incredibly proud of those. But this one is, again, a, I believe, another step up from issue seven. Like you said, like this issue coming up and, and the ones you've already hinted at that you've already kind of got plans and themes for, What what what's kind of next? What are the aspirations for MPLH from what it started as to what it's now kind of associated with to what you want? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I guess the main objective is to get it seen by more people. We're we're kind of relatively under the radar still after two years, which it, in a way is a good thing because lots of people can still discover us, and it's it's fun when we. It's yeah, so it's kind of satisfying when you get a new reader and they say, oh, "Is there no way I can get issues one to four? five six and i'm sorry they they're gone but you know you've um you've done a good job when they're after those you know you know and the likelihood is they'll come back for the next one because they've they've enjoyed the work so much uh, so yeah i guess the main objective is to spread the word a lot more and get the the writers the recognition that i think they deserve the artists are getting plenty so they, yeah, definitely time for the writers to to have their moment in the sun. Um, it's it's a tough market. I'm sure most of the mags that you speak to will um, say the same thing. It's not easy, and you'll see, you know, there's bigger magazines than us that are either going digital or going under. So it's we're we're incredibly grateful that people keep buying it, so that we can keep making another one. So I guess the, in short, yeah, the answer, the quick answer is to sell more copies and um, build up a, a reliable base that we know we can, so that we know we've got a long-term future for the magazine rather than just uh, living issue to issue, I guess. Yeah, and we're getting closer to that, absolutely. In terms of projects beyond the magazine it would be great to be involved with grassroots initiatives and maybe start our own and so the mplh is something other than just a magazine but yeah we'll 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 see that needs to kind of be the right move rather than just a move for the sake of it but there's definitely more that we can do with mplh other than just football writing and yeah football storytelling and and artistic um an artistic outlet for people, I guess, yeah. Yeah, and that's kind of the perfect answer is that 
why I think this and what this kind of show is all about is the the football magazines. Is, it's more than just you know something you pick up. It's it's a community that people build, and you can kind of tell if somebody likes this magazine, then they'll probably also like this movie or this this kind of thing. But they believe in kind of the same sort of core issues as you do because they're enjoying something from that. Um, so before we kind of wrap up completely. A question we're going to be asking all our guests on behind the scenes, and it's a pretty tough one, is if you had to describe your magazine as a football player from any era, which one would it be and why? <laughs> yeah, that is, a, that is a really good one. And it, um, the one that comes to mind is David Beckham. <laughs> and which era of David Beckham? Um, the era of David Beckham, I would say... Um, up to and including 2003. Uh, very, very pretty. Um, but there's um, the, yeah, substance as well as style. And he does the simple things well. <laughs> That's a brilliant answer. <laughs> <laughs> so make sure you check out No Place Like Home and when the next issue drops, be sure to pick up a copy um thanks for listening be sure to like the video and subscribe and leave us a comment letting us know what your favorite football photograph is so joe do you have one yeah um tough one again because there's so many out there but david beckham again um playing at upton park back in the 90s there's a picture where he's been uh he's been upended by steve lomas and if you can find it definitely dig it out is David Beckham's effectively standing on his head with a very angry sun-kissed Steve Lomas barking at him aggressively and it just sums up the the mood um, towards David Beckham at that time post France 98 uh, before his uh, before he won over the nation again but it's an incredible image of a, but it, it, yeah it's and it sums up David Beckham's mentality for me he was absolutely battered that day by everyone including the crowd Steve Lomas being one of them but he just never gave up but it's a it's a funny image if you can find it for me it would probably be bias but it'd probably be Istanbul 2005 kind of the iconic image of Steven Gerrard kind of geeing everyone up and it's you know looking kind of always say like a bag of rags of his armbands slipping down and I think that just you could show anyone that picture and they kind of know exactly where it is what, what happened in 2005? I think we won the Champions League. Oh, fifth nice. time. See, we've won it again since, so <laughs> it's easy to forget which one. You which forget one what it year it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I actually was in Australia when that final was played, and I slept in. I woke up at half time and it was 3-0. I was like, ah, oh, back to bed. Um, missed the second half. Went into the centre of Sydney a few hours later on, and the streets were just full of people, hammered. I asked the guy what was going on and he said Liverpool won. And I said, that's not possible. It's not possible. And uh, he showed me and I was like, wow, gutted that I went back to bed. Absolutely gutted. <laughs> but yeah, so a massive thank you to everyone for watching. A massive thank you to Joe for taking us behind the scenes of No Place Like Home. Thanks for having me. 